So here's what I want to do today. By the end of the call, I want you to have a simple one-page business plan for next year. A simple one-page business plan. Um, and you get to, this is the beginning of you working on it. In other words, you're going to start today working on your business plan and you need to have it done by December 15th. Okay. So you should be taking notes. I know what I'm doing when it comes to mortgages. The other areas of my life, I need lots of help. But when it comes to business and mortgages, I've been lucky enough to have lots of help. I learned from builders I work with that you start your business plan in uh, in November and you have it done. They have theirs done before Thanksgiving. And I think it's smart, right? So if you get leads, if you get leads in November, when do they become paychecks? January at the best, right? At the soonest, January. I mean, yes, once in a while it can be faster, but on average, it's at least two or three months later. So really, next year has already started. Next year has already started and this year is over. So what I wanted to do is start off by covering. So I, I want you to leave with a one-page business plan. We're going to fill it out together. Um, and I want you to realize it's a draft and that in order to get the, the, the paper and the, and the information I'm going to go over with you today, you can get the copies and the originals by emailing the loan officer that you work with at Summit that invited you to this. So all the stuff I'm going to talk about, all the stuff I'm going to have you fill out or, or watch me fill out, you can get it by emailing the loan officer you work with. Sound good? These are all very serious, but that's okay. I'm going to make it work. I like interaction. I don't know how to have interaction on a big old Zoom thing like this. All right. So if you have questions as we go, you type them into the chat. I'm not really sure how to do that. Do you know how to do that, Chuck? I don't know how to do that. You don't have to, you don't have to unmute yourself. So you're going to type them into the chat, and then Jonas is going to be reading them. And when he finds good ones, he's going to stop me and ask me, and I'll answer it as we go. So you know what that means, Terry? That means if you typed your question in there and he didn't read it, it means it wasn't a very good question. <laughs> you, guys are, you guys are too serious. So I want to start by summarizing. I got to move this closer. The last time I got to speak for this big group was when, Jonas? How long ago? Three months? Well, you yeah, three months ago. Yeah, two or three months ago, I did uh, 50, how to create 50 leads a month. And I covered uh, a lot of ideas around leads and lead generation. And one of the things I covered with you guys is this, this circle. And this circle represents closed transactions for real estate agents, right? So for your whole year, this represents your closings. So again, this is, this is a refresher. And the way you get leads, the way you get leads is you mail to people, either email or snail mail, right? You call people on the phone, and you meet people in person. You mail, call, and you visit. And the categories are of closings are, or they can be divided into three simple groups. The first one is you get closings from your database. How many of you guys get closings from your database? Raise your hand. Okay, okay, it's interactive. You all get closings from your database. Your database is your past clients, your friends, your family, maybe people that you work with or you network with. Anybody that you know that you have their name, address, and phone number goes into your database and you mail to them once a month. You call them a few times a year. We went over this last time. You have a couple of client appreciation parties a year to visit with them. And then, then when they need real estate or lending, they call you and they use you. So that's one category. About half of a good realtor's closings come from the database. So it's pretty significant. And then a quarter of a, a good realtor, a long, a long term, been in the business a long time, a quarter of a realtor's business comes from advertising. If you're in real estate, you got to have some form of advertising to generate leads. So that would be open houses, social media. I hate to admit, I don't really like social media that much. It's very weird for me. I don't like it. I don't enjoy it. I've never gone on social media and then felt better about myself when I got off. It's a dry audience, Jonas, very dry audience. It's okay. So uh, 
Advertising is open houses, internet. If you're paying for Zillow leads, that's advertising. So about a quarter of, of your leads, 25% of your closings, if you're a good long-term realtor, comes from advertising. And then the last category on here, a quarter of your closings, they come from business to business relationships, okay? Business to business relationships. And I think that we shared this on the last call. I think for most of us, most of you guys, wow, I look like I'm in a, I think I need to turn my light on. Do I need to turn my light on? Yeah, okay. I got it, Rebecca, I'm fat. About a quarter of your closings, and again, I think it's the biggest opportunity for real estate agents, um, I think it's the most untapped category. That's business to business. That's when a realtor gets leads and closings from CPAs, from financial planners. If you're involved in like a leads group, that's business to business. If your lender gives you referrals, that's business to business. Um, and the, the example I gave last time, um, the best, the best one I've ever seen that I know like. Like a lot of people talk about ideas for getting business, but a lot of it's just talk. Would you agree? They, they've never even tried it and they run around telling you how great of an idea it is. The only one that I've ever verified that you know, and found out is really good is a business to business category is hospitals. So the recruiter or the HR director at a big hospital is a great source for realtors for business to business. They're in business, you're in business, and you get business from them. So we covered that a lot last time. I'm not going to cover all of that this time, but I wanted to start by refreshing this, this idea. And, and our definition last time, if you remember, of, um, of a realtor or of a good business is, number one is you make a high six-figure income. We all agreed that would be cool. Uh, uh, number two is you get to take one full day off a week, right? If you're a realtor, you, you usually work at least six days a week. Now, it's not eight or 10 hours every day, but, but we want to take at least one full day off a week. Um, no phone call, no email, usually Sunday, but not necessarily. Um, we want to stay married if we're married, okay? Or get married if we're not. You're not supposed to go through this life alone. And if you're married to your business, it's usually hard to be married to someone else. So that's what was part of our definition. Uh, and the other thing is when you get home from work, you don't kick the cat. So in other words, you're happy. That was our definition. And so this all came from tracking the best realtors in the core, where their closings actually come from. And so I just wanted to refresh that. Now, something that's important on here uh, that we're maybe going to use later is the conversion rate. Right, so we talked about this last time, but for every 10 leads a realtor gets, they usually get one check, one closing. Every 10 leads. The best, the best conversion on here is, which one? I'm gonna wait, Hayden, you're stuffing your mouth with pizza, Hayden. Somebody tell me, what's the biggest conversion? Database. <laughs> Database. database has the highest conversion rate. That's usually around 40% of the 10, 10 leads, four paychecks, maybe a little less than that. Um, that's what we, we've tracked in the coaching business. This, the worst one on here is which one? Business what? to business. <laughs> wow. Well, it was a bad idea. It was a bad idea because everybody's talking over everybody, Chelsea. It was a terrible idea. Advertising is the worst conversion rate. Advertising is the worst, and specifically, internet paid advertising has the worst conversion rate. It's like 300 to one closing. Now, you may have a system that's a little better. Okay, I don't want to argue with anybody, but this is, this is statistics that I've, that I've proven. So that's the worst, that's the best. Business to business, it's usually about 25% of those go to close because business to business, a business to business closing is referred. And that's the ones that have the best closing rate. All right. 
So on average, it's 10 leads for one closing. That's going to be important later on in our talk. So we're going to come back to that. Do you want us to use unmute? I don't really know. I'm not really sure, Jasic. It's not my specialty. Jonas is in charge of that stuff. I just have the information. Okay, cool. Jason is waving at me. Sweet. All right. So now I want to talk about um, the business cycle a little bit. Um, like, how's your business doing? Raise your hand if you're kicking ass. It's the best it's ever been. Okay, that's one. Martha, I think you might be on some kind of drugs. We want some. Like, it's the worst I've ever seen it in lending. I'm just joking. She's yelling at me. So listen, it's been a big downturn. Why? Because the, because here's the real reason why. People are watching in the news that the economy is shaky. And so they're nervous and scared. So, uh-oh, they're laughing. Jasic, what'd you do? What'd you tell about me, Jasic? So the economy's not doing well. And rates have went up more faster than they ever have. And so people are scared. And when people are scared, they normally don't do anything. So the business has tapered off, especially if you can compare it to the previous two years. So I want to talk about that in business. What's going to happen over the winter is this. And I really like live public speaking because you guys can talk with me. I really don't like this. So here's what's going to happen. It feels like lecture mode, right? When I went to lecture mode in college, I just left. I just, I just left. Uh, so don't leave me. So um, so the business cycle, uh, it goes up and down all the time. What's going to happen over the winter to the number of realtors in the business? It's going to go down. How much is it going to go down? He says 50%. I say that's the minimum, right? I say that's the minimum. In lending, I think the number of loan officers is going to go down Close to 70% of people that are loan officers will get out of the business. And the, the biggest reason in, in lending is because refis have dried up and a lot of people, that's all they did. But in real estate, the, you guys will also have a, a reduction of the sales force. There'll be people that are going down. So I want to teach you a mindset of how to survive during the next six months, because I really believe that if you can get going, get busy, and make it through the next six months in a positive way, that the business is gonna get a lot easier after that. Because there'll be the same amount of transactions, right? But there'll be way less competition. And that'll make it feel like there's way more business, but there won't be way more business. There'll just be way less realtors. I'll take either one to be frank. I just want more business. So uh, if you can share your screen, Rebecca, I don't know if this is going to work. I learned this from a mentor of mine and my boss, Todd, and I think he learned it from a book. Is it coming? There it comes. So I want you to look through this. Um, this is kind of, he called it the achievement cycle. This is your the lifespan of a salesperson or, or a business. Um, and I, I'm just going to talk you through it. I'll, I'll go fairly quickly. But when we first enter the business, you know, there's a lot of emotions and feelings going on. Usually we're nervous. Did we make the right choice? Uh, are we going to be able to make it in this crazy business? We're excited the first time we get a lead or the first time we write an offer on a, a property and we get a call that it got accepted. It's pretty exciting. There's lots of that energy going on. Um, but then a lot of people don't make it past that. And the number one ingredient to making it past that is mentorship. Okay, finding a mentor in the business that will teach you and guide you and help you make less mistakes, someone that you trust. That's how you get over the first wall. So what happens after you find a mentor and uh, and they're they're grooming you and you're working hard and you're working late and you're putting in lots of hours, you're gaining knowledge and you're gaining skills, right? How to communicate better, how to how to write an offer better so it gets accepted how to stay in control of your escrow so they don't fall out. Um, all these skills that you've developed, that happens in the beginning. And what it builds is confidence. You've felt this in your business where you all of a sudden you're confident. And it shows, right? Confidence shows. Like when you're sitting in front of a potential client and you're confident, they feel it. And 
it makes it easier for them to choose you. Right? And right now, what's happened to a lot of people is they're losing some of their confidence because they're getting shopped so much, because people aren't sure if they should buy right now. Because let's be honest, realtors themselves aren't sure we should buy right now. Some of them. And that stuff comes out. Like people can read it in your language, in your body, in your face. So going back to this chart, we make it over the first hurdle with, with mentorship. It builds our confidence. We start to make more money. We're in good times. We're buying the car, we're buying the house, we're growing the family, and we feel like we feel like a 17-year-old boy. 17-year-old boy, they think that nothing can kill them. They're totally bulletproof. Don't worry, dad. I got this. They don't listen to the old man. They got it going on. They're bulletproof. And then something happens. Something happens. Sometimes we do it to ourselves, right? Sometimes we start to believe the hype and we make bad choices or we take our foot off the gas and we, we don't work as hard. We stop doing open houses, silly things. But sometimes it's outside of our control. Like right now, it's outside of our control. Rates went from three the seven and a half in the same calendar year. It's never happened. That affected real estate a lot. That affected real estate a ton, actually. Um, and so all of a sudden, when I'm meeting with people as a realtor, they're deciding not to buy the house. Uh, they're deciding to use a different realtor that maybe will charge 2% instead of three. Or, or they're deciding to buy a new home instead of a used home. A resale home. And what that happens in your body and in your mind is it starts to be, you start to have fear. Am I going to make it? Is this the right business for me? Um, and then that leads to anxiety. I didn't, I had to look up anxiety. Anxiety is the expression of fear. Anxiety is when people can tell you're scared, when people can tell that you're nervous. And so you have fear, anxiety, and then it leads to dissolution. And this is the one that I've seen happen in my sales force. I've had it happen to me. I've seen it happen specifically in some of the loan officers that work for me. I've seen it in mortgage company owners. I've heard it on the phone with some of the realtors who work for me. And it sounds like this. And it looks like this. I wonder what else I could do. I wonder what job can I find where I can at least make two, 200000 Uh, It looks like this. You spend time on Indeed looking for jobs, looking for a management job, looking for another job. You start considering other options. Or it looks like this. My broker makes too much money. I need a dip, better split. Uh, our company needs to um, change the our comp plan. And we, we do all the work anyway. That's dissolution. That's when you are not thinking properly. And the problem with it is you start to do it over and over again. And it, and it occupies your thoughts. And, and if you let it, it will... Occupy your thoughts so much that it will change what you believe. And that is dangerous because as soon as it changes what you believe, it's going to change the way you act. It's going to change your behavior. And unfortunately, it's going to really affect your work ethic. And then that's a spiral. That's a decline. That's when you may or may not realize it, but you're really close to getting out of the business. And you'll start making bad choices. In other words, you're making less money, but you won't change your spending habits. That's not a good idea, right? You'll start spending more time at places you shouldn't be hanging out at, the mall, 
Nordstrom's. Not a good spot to hang out, okay? The bar. These are not places to spend time. And that's what happens when you go through dissolution and you go on the decline. And then um, here's that second brick wall. And, it, and it's really because at that, at that location on that wall, I can't point nowhere because you know I like to be more alive, but you're at a, you're at a crossroads. And in one direction, you're going, you literally will be out of the business. I am telling you, many of the people on this call today won't be in the business by June of next year unless they change the way they think and they listen They listen to what I'm teaching you. So you have two choices once you get to the decline spot. One is go out of business. And the second one is develop skills. So skill development is the only way to get back over to the green side of this chart. It's the only way. It's not by getting a better deal from your boss. It's not by going to work for a builder and selling new homes. It's not by going to work for a builder mortgage company as a loan officer. It's not that. The only way is through developing skills. And for some of us with gray hair, it means relearning things we used to know. Sometimes we used to have the skill and we don't have it no more. Sometimes it's learning a skill we never had and we need to learn it. But I am telling you the only way, say it louder for those in the back, but I'm yelling. The only way is skill development. You have to change your skills. So I'm just going to give you a list of skills you need. Okay, because I can't do the interactive way. So you need to be better at your professional presentation. It needs to be polished. In it, you need to answer the questions. Why should they use you? Why should they buy right now? What is great about your company? How do I know if I'm making a good decision? Your professional presentation needs to have triangle for trust. It needs to uncover what's most important to them. And then ask them why seven times in a row till you find out the real why. There is no connection with your client if you're not emotional with your client. If you don't believe me, I'm happy. That means there'll be less competition in six months. I know it sounds rude, but I promise I know what I'm talking about. You need a professional presentation. You need to work. You need to know how to work open houses better. You need to know what questions to ask. You need to know how to get their information in a non-threatening way. Jim, can, can we have Rebecca that? stop the screen share? Oh, so I'm, ready, I'm ready, I'm ready, I'm ready. I'm all fired up now. You cut me off right when I was fired up. Go ahead. Are you just cutting it off because you want to see me bouncing around? We just wanted to see you instead of the screen share. We got okay. you. Okay, do you have any questions in there that I want to ask since you cut me? I think right now we're good. Okay, so skill development. So how to work an open house better. Here's a skill. How to follow up better with leads. You got to work on uh, education. How does the sales funnel work? What are the steps to a sale? Like we lost all our skills, Jonas, because the phone rang and we they said, I want to refi. And we said, okay, rates are 2.75. They said, okay, here's my credit card. That don't take a lot of skill. As a real estate agent, they said, we want to buy a house and they seem to be gone as, as fast as the, as fast as I see them. And the realtor said, you're going to have to make a fifty dollars to $100,000 offer more than asking. And they said, okay. And the realtor sold the house. Now, you may be mad at me, but that's the truth. And it's gone. And the only way to, 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 to grow again is to learn the skills you used to learn, loose to know. Find a mentor, have a process. I can't cover all of that today, but if you guys like my presentation and you tell Jonas, I'll come back and do it. I got a lot to say about this. We just, we just got entitled. We just felt like 
I'm 54 years old. I've been doing loans 27 years. I don't have to go to open houses. I don't got to call people back on Sundays. I don't got to do my borrower appointments in person. Sound like you? Maybe a little bit. I'm telling you, you've got to change the way you think. And the, the way to change is hang out with people that are going to make it and dust off these skills. So that's what's that's where we're at. Skill development. One of the skills that you can get better at is business planning. Business planning. That's what we're going to do with the rest of our time. Have a business plan. If you have a business plan and the market changes, can you change your plan? If you have a business plan and it's not working, can you change your plan? So don't worry about it. Start with a plan. Change it along the way if you need to. Don't worry about making it perfect. One of the lessons I learned, uh, and it's a skill actually, I learned from my buddy Todd who runs Summit Funding. I worked for him and you guys got to know this part of the story. I was a checker and he was a bag. I met him at a grocery store. We were both in college. And I can tell you this, I didn't think he was anything special. I thought I was smarter than him. I thought I was better than him at just about everything. I was wrong. So we started, I started working for him and he would just, he'd come home from seminars and stuff and he'd have this idea and he would just implement it. And I'd be like, that ain't gonna work. Dude, we gotta have it. We gotta have a better plan. We got to, like, what about this? What about that? Well, how's this going to happen? When's this going to happen? And I would be like, basically saying no, but I didn't realize it. And I want it to be better planned before we, before we do it. So we don't look like knuckleheads. And he would just implement the dang plan and then work on making it better all the time. And finally I went, oh, that's how you do it. That's how you do it. Like, it's kind of like having babies. You're never really ready for a baby. Right. All of a sudden, she's pregnant, and you're having a baby, and then you go to the hospital, and then a little baby comes out, and then they go like, "Here you go, Mr. Reed," and you're like, "Whoa, whoa, whoa, whoa! I'm not ready for that." That's how. That's how. That's how this works. You just figure it out as you go. So you got to get a business plan. So I want to start by figuring out how much. And now this is gonna sound crazy. How much money you need to retire? So we're going to start with that. You guys ready? So you're going to have to keep up. I go kind of fast. You got a pencil and a paper. It would help if you had a calculator. If you don't have a calculator, I have this on a form that's easy to follow. And where do you get the form, Jonas? You can get it from your loan officer in the place you're attending. They will have it after uh, Jim. All you got to do is call or email your loan officer and they will have it. So whoever invited you, reach out to them after and they'll give you this piece of paper. But I'd like you to try and fill it out as we go. So I'm going to make it super simple. So the first thing I need you to write down is um, how much money you need to spend per month to retire. How much money do you need to spend per month? Like house payment, car payment, utilities, travel, clothes, food, gifts, all that stuff. For me, it's about $20,000. That's how much I need. To, I know. I know. It's crazy. I know. I know. I know. So that's what I need. That's what I need. I need 20 grand spendable a month. I got reasons. I got an ex-wife. I got reads. So don't judge me. 20 grand a month. That's what I need. 20 grand a month. So I need 20 grand a month. So I write down 20,000. So now I don't want to, I'm not going to make any adjustments to your number that complicated. People say, oh, well, things will be more expensive in the future. Blah, blah, blah. I don't do any adjustments because I'll earn social security at some point and that'll balance out inflation and all that stuff. So it's super simple. I need 20 grand a month. I don't really think I should do my numbers for this example. I think we should do eight grand a month. I need eight grand a month to live. Okay, is that better? Everybody was laughing hysterically when I said 20. We'll go with eight. 
8,000 a month. So now for me, for, for every million dollars I have in the bank, okay? Every million dollars I have in the bank, I can get $4,000 a month in tax-free money. It's called a tax-free municipal bond. I just bought some and I got a return of 5%. So if I had a million dollars in the bank, it'll give me 50,000 a year and I don't have to pay taxes on it because it's a tax-free municipal bond. So that's actually a little more than 4,000, but we're going to use every million will give me $4,000 a month to spend. And I don't touch the principal. Any questions on that? Super important. You understand that piece. All right. Nothing popping up in the chat. Sweet. So now I take, uh, I take uh, the number and I divide it by 4,000 and it'll tell me how many millions I need. So take the number that you need, the, you know, the monthly spending. I think 20,000. I, I think you guys need more money than you think, but whatever. We'll go with eight grand. So take eight grand, divide it by four, divide it by 4,000 and it comes up with, I need $2 million to retire. Make sense? Cool. So I need $2 million to retire. Now I need to write down how much do I have right now? How much do I have right now? So this is something that people don't really understand is you only get to count 50% of your retirement money for this exercise because that income is taxable when you pull it out. So Add up how much you have in checking and savings, how much you have in any like investment accounts. That's like a Charles Schwab account that you bought some stocks and bonds in. And then add up 50% of any IRAs or 401ks. Everybody with me so far? Some people got a scared look on their face. Any questions? Cool. So now you take the $2 million in my example, and I subtract how much more money, how much money I have right now. And then that tells me how much money I need to save. How much money I need to save. So you should all be you should all know how much more money you need to save. Anybody want to share with me how much more money they need to save? Where's Mr. Purple? He left. He got bored. Where'd he go? Oh, he's in trouble with me. All right. Let's see. Somebody. Blake. Somebody. P, how much more money you guys save? A lot. <laughs> well, that's good. You're young. You're young. So. You got to save a certain amount of more money. Now, at a 6% rate of return, which is an average rate of return in the stock market, um, they're going to take the number of years you have left to work. See, how many more years are you going to work? About 36, 37. How old are you, dude? 32. You're going to work till you're 62? Yeah. Cool. Sweet. So 30 more years. Uh, my, own, my, my little chart only goes up to 30 more years of work. So I'm going to go with 30 more years. Okay. So if you work 30 more years, you take the amount of money that you got to stick with me. I got to figure out how much your current savings is going to be in the number of years you have left. Does that make sense, Jonas? This is very complicated stuff. So right now you have a certain amount of money in the bank. Be right, and you're going to work 30 more years. So, if you don't touch that money that you have in the bank, how much will it be in 30 more years? Here's how you figure it out take the amount of money you currently have in the bank fee, and if you're going to work 30 more years, you multiply it by 7.5. 
If you're going to work 20 more years, you multiply your current savings by 3.85. If you're going to work 10 more years, you multiply your current savings by two. If you're only going to work five more years, you multiply your current savings by 1.4. Now, why do most Americans retire with not enough money? Because this is not easy. It's confusing, and most people get halfway through it and they throw their hands up and don't think about it no more. So just knuckle down for a, a couple more minutes and we'll get through this. If you're gonna work 25 more years, you take your current savings and you multiply it by 5.4. Now someone has to have a question. Are you looking through the chat, Jonas? Read me one if there's one. No, nope. none. Does everybody <laughs> understand what I'm saying, right? Okay, so, oh, no, who's that? Manta, who's that? Martha Martin. Unmute yourself, Martha, and ask me a question. Okay, she said, I like that. <laughs> My two favorite letters of the alphabet, Chelsea, okay. Are you, all, are you Martha, are you there? So, Jim, I do got a question in there. <laughs> hold on, hold on, Jonas. Martha, are you there? Peace. You're not going to talk? That means hey, hey, I'm talking. I'm talking. Can you hear me? Yes, now I can. Ask me your okay. question. Okay. Uh, okay. So I have, I, I couldn't figure out the math or the formula. So I have $55,000 in the bank. Okay. I want to work 15 more years. Okay. Stop right there. Stop right there. You have okay. 55000 in the bank, right? Yes. Okay. And, and you're going to work 15 more years, right? Yes. Yes. So if you, as long as you have that money invested in the stock market, or whatever. I mean, don't just leave it in a savings account earning no no return. Right. No, it's it's earning ten percent now. Okay. Then and then in fifteen more years, that fifty five thousand will be one hundred and fifty one thousand. Okay. That's all we're doing for right now. Okay. Sweet. I'm cut up. Okay, <laughs> you're you. caught up. Jonas, go. All right, Jonas. Asked, did you have another question? Yeah, Janessa asked, where do you pull those numbers from, the amount you multiply the savings by? She's asking me if I'm credible? No, no. <laughs> yeah, that's what she's asking me, bro. I read between the lines really, really well. So I have a stockbroker I've been using for 30 years, and I went to him, and I said, hey, I want to make a formula. And so he said, okay, we have to assume a rate of return. And I said, well, what is the, what should we do? He said, well, sometimes the stock market gives you 10 or 15 Sometimes it gets negative. He said, I think a safe average rate of return is 6%. And I said, okay, let's assume it's 6%. He said, okay, then I can give you a formula where you take the current savings, multiply it by a factor, which is the number of years that you're going to work and assume a 6% constant rate of return. And it'll tell you how much money you will be. So that's how I'm credible. And I spent a lot of time thinking and working on not losing all my money. So that's how come I'm credible. Good question. More questions? No, good. Can you hear me? Can you hear me? Yeah, I can. We have a question in the room. What if you have 1.8 million and want to work five more years? How much more do you need? Well, you're, you're jumping ahead on the how much more do you need, but if you have 1.8 million, congratulations and you want to work five more years, if you don't save any more money, if you don't save any more money and you haven't invested, it'll be 2.5 million by the time you, you five years comes up. There you go. Okay. Thank you. So we, I haven't gotten to the next step yet because I want to make sure everybody got this one. Some people are getting <laughs> bored. Some people are still lost, but I'm going to have to keep moving. All right. So, so, so far we figured out how much money we need we figured out how much money, how much our current savings will be when we want to retire, even if we don't save any more money. That's all we've done so far. It's very challenging. So I'm glad you guys are sticking with me because the reason I do this once a year is it helps me with motivation. 
It helps me set my goals and motivation. More money makes more money. More money. All right. So now I take the amount of money that I need for retirement and I subtract the number I just gave you. So for the lady who told me she had a million eight, uh, let's say she needs 3 million. Her 1.8 will be 2.5 when she retires. And she needed 3 million. So she only got to save 500,000 in the next five years. Did light bulbs go on or not? A little bit. Jasic, your group seems extremely lost, Jasic. They look like maybe they have no clue what's going on. That was very fast. That was very fast talking. I was just teasing a little bit on that, Jasic. So, so now we know how much money we got to save for the amount of time we're going to work. Right? That we know how much time we how much money we got to save over the amount of time we got to work. Now, this is going to blow your mind. Take 70% of that. So in her example, she needed to save $500,000 more in the next five years. So we're going to take 70% of $500,000, which I think is $350,000. Now, the reason I do that is because as you're saving money and you're investing it, it's also growing at 6%. That makes sense, guys? I know you're just going to have to trust me at some point. I promise this stuff works. So 70% of that is, is the number. And then we divide that by the number of months we're still going to work. So she needs to save 350 grand in the next five years. And there's 60 months in five years, right? She got to save 5,833 bucks a month for five more years and she'll hit $3 million and then she'll be able to retire on 12 grand spendable a month. I think about 50% of you gave up, about 30% of you get it, and 20% are really close. What do you think, Jonas? Now, listen, I've done this every year with a group of people. If nothing else, you're at least starting to think about how much money you need. So you email your, your loan officer and they will get you this sheet and you just fill it out line by line and you'll get to the act, exact number that you need to save each month. And, and, and listen, why do you guys work? Unmute yourselves and tell me, why do you go to work? Support my family. Cool. I go to work to make money to take care of my boys. Absolutely. Why else do you work? We enjoy it. If you're in a group room, you can't talk. I'm sorry. It's got to be individuals only. We just can't hear you. Why else do you work? I go to work because I really think I help people. I think I help the people who work for me grow, and I help people buy houses. I help real estate agents get their deals closed fast, and they get happy when they get paid so they can take care of their family. So yeah, I go to work to make money and I go to work to help other people. And the last one, I go to work to retire someday. Now, I always thought that once I had enough money to retire, I would. But that's not true. But it's nice to have the choice, isn't it? Now, what other industry could you be in where you don't have to have a PhD college degree you can make crazy amounts of money and save a bunch of money and retire someday. We are so lucky to be in this business. So lucky. And it's a storm that we're in. And getting together and talking about it in groups like this, it dramatically increases our chances of making it to next year. That's the truth. So email your loan officer, get this form, sit down with them and fill it out together and figure out how much you need to save. Because I need that number, or you need that number, to figure out how many sides you need to do a month. Right? I got to take, 
how much money I need to pay all my bills and live the life I want to live, plus how much money I need to save to reach my retirement goals for when I want to retire, add those two together. Then I need to divide that by how much I make per deal. Right? And then I got to come up with a certain number of deals, three, four, five deals a month. And then I got to take this formula that says for every one deal that I need, I got to do 10 leads. So if I got to, if I got to get five closings a month, I need 50 leads, right? And if I get 50 leads, I can take care of all my dreams. That is super important because now I can start to control my calendar and I can put the activities in it that'll get me 50 leads a month. Make sense, guys? Once a year, you got to do the brain damage that this takes to go over money. Whew, that was a struggle. But now we're going to go on to something a little easier, a little easier, a little less math. Ah, does anybody help their kids with math lately? They don't do math the same way they used to. I can't even help my own kid with math. It's crazy. All right, put up the where are you now screen. We're going to do a quick goal setting thing, and then we're going to do the one page uh, business plan. This is going to go pretty quick. So on a piece of paper, be ready. Rebecca, share the where are you now page. This is a goal setting exercise uh, that's part of business planning uh, that I've been doing for about 25 years. And Rebecca's working on it or she's not there. She's not there. Okay, she left. Jim, so, I, I got the stuff from her, but it, uh, I have the one-year business plan and the Wheel of Life. Yeah, the that. Where Are You Now is the first page of the Wheel of Life. Gotcha. I'll share it. She delegated to you? Wow, that's impressive. So on a piece of paper, there, we believe there's seven areas of your life. Work, money, love life, family, spirituality, friends, and yourself. That's not it, Fee. Be careful. Don't share the wrong thing, B. It can be very dangerous, B. I probably would just abort the whole mission, dog. I would just, I would just cancel. That's what I would do. I would just cancel and I'll do it verbally. All right. Share the other screen, B. Share the other yeah, screen. It's okay. Don't do it, B. All right, here we go. So where are you now? So I want you to write down a piece of paper and work. Right? On a piece of paper, you got a pen. You're not looking at the screen no more, J6 group. You're looking at your paper. You write down with a pen. Oh, they're not listening. So on work, I want you to write down two things that are frustrating you about work. So if you're a realtor and you're listening, I want you to write two things frustrating you about your work, your job. So one could be not enough leads. One could be you don't like your broker. One could be you're writing too many offers and not getting them accepted. One could be you're 0 for 6 on your last listing appointments to try to get a listing. Write down something that's bugging you about your job. I want two things. Write them down. Don't skip this. Don't blow this off. This, this, this silly form changed my life. Well, Fee, you're going to get heckled, heckled about this for about two years. About, about two years. All right. So two things that are frustrating you about work. You got them? Now, the next category is money. I want you to write down two things. Could you go to her desk and do it, B? Would that be safer? Why don't you try it? So on money, I want you to write down two things frustrating you about money. So for example, maybe you don't do a personal family budget each month. That could frustrate you. Maybe what frustrates you is the amount of credit card debt you have. Maybe it frustrates you that you haven't started saving yet. Uh, maybe it frustrates you that you have no idea What's the difference between a stock or a bond and how to pick one? There we go. This is this is uh, where, nope, now you go back. This ain't it. Back, this ain't it. Where will you be? You're getting closer, Pete. So write two things down that are frustrating you about money. Next, I want you to write down two things that are frustrating you about your love life. Hayden, write them down. <laughs> when you eat pizza, I remember you. That's how it works. So two things about your love life. Like maybe it could be, um, you know, spend enough time just you and your partner. 
two things that are frustrating about love life. For some of you, maybe you don't have a love life. It's bugging you. Two things that are frustrating you about your love life. I want two. Next is family. Like for me, what's bugging me most about family is my 17-year-old son uses my house like a hotel. Right? I want I want to eat dinner with them. I want to hang out with them more. Uh, and it frustrates me. I'm not worried about the solution yet, guys. I'm just writing things that pop out in my mind that bug me. So we've done work, money, love, life, family. Spirituality. Two things that are bugging you or frustrating you about your spirituality. I tell this part of this all, every time I do this. When I first started filling out this form, my frustration was I didn't know what spirituality meant to me. So you can write that down if you don't know what it means to you. If you go to church, maybe you're frustrated with the church you're at. Or you're frustrated with the pastor. Uh, so write down two things bugging you about spirituality. Um, and then two things about friends. Like I had this group of friends and in high school, or actually high school and college, and I lost touch with them. So that's what I wrote down. Wasn't spending time pursuing my friends. Didn't hang out with my friends enough. Friends are an important part of any person's life. So write down two things bugging you about friends. And if you don't have any, that would be a good thing to write down. And then two more things that are bugging you about yourself. Like your weight, your fitness level, your diet. Uh, maybe it bugs you you haven't made time to read because you love to read. Two things that are bugging you about yourself. If you just give, 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 and you don't take care of yourself, what eventually happens? You build resentment for everybody around you that you're giving to, and then you blame them for you for you not taking care of yourself. So don't do that. Write these things down. Now, put a number next to the category and rate yourself in the area on a scale from 1 to 10. 10 is not really an option. I'm not a 10 at anything. I really don't think one is either, really. And we used to play a game when we did this form. You can't put a seven down. So on a scale of one to 10, write down how you're doing at work, how you're doing with money, how you're doing with your love life. Write down how you're doing with family, spirituality, friends, and yourself. Write this stuff down. I'm going to go try to help feed for one second. She has an example. You can't bring it out. That one. Leave it right there. My goodness. So, I did this exercise earlier today of getting ready for this class. I filled out my two frustrations and I did my visual wheel. So you're going to get these forms from your loan officer. So I wrote down my biggest aha is I've been ignoring my health. That's been, I didn't realize how bad it was bugging me until I did this exercise. So my wheel is not round and it makes it obvious what I need to work on most. I need to work on myself, my family, and my friends. Because once my wheel is round, then I can make it bigger in all the areas. If I just focus on work all the time, eventually all the other ones are going to suffer. All right, now it's goal setting time. Now you're going to go back to the page you were at before, Fee, where it says, where do you want to be? Uh, oh, no, oh, other way. Ooh, ooh. Where will you be? There you go. So now I want you to put down two specific goals, at least one for today, in each area. Okay? In each area. Like, make a goal for work. Like, if you're frustrated with your leads, Make a goal to hold four open houses in the next two weeks or hold. I will hold one open house a week. I will average four open houses a month for the next six months. If you did that, would your business get better? Yes, it would. And maybe you put down uh, for work. I, I will meet with three HR directors at hospitals in the next six months. If you did that, it would help your business. 
Maybe your goal for work is I will hold one client appreciation party by the end of the year. We do pictures with Santa. That helps our business. So put down two specific, measurable, and achievable goals, at least one for the day in each of the areas. Money. Put down a goal that you will fill out a personal budget form once a month. That's a good start. Maybe you put a goal that you'll pay off one credit card by the end of the year. Man, the end of the year is coming up pretty quick. Hey, I don't know if we can do it. It's pretty fast. It's only six weeks. A goal in your love life. Uh, you could do a date night box, or I'll tell you a goal. Every year, one, at least one full one week vacation with just you and your spouse. No kids. No couples, no uncles, no aunts, just you and your spouse for a whole week. I highly recommend it. You'll remember why you like each other. Without it, you can forget why you like each other. All right. So goal for family. I put two nights a week. You're not allowed to miss dinner, 630. You can bring whoever you want. But on Wednesdays and Sundays, if you're my son, you got to be at my house at 6.30 and eat dinner, period. No exceptions, no exceptions. So that was a good goal. And we started doing it, and now I'm happier. I started, I started being so frustrated with my kids because I wasn't seeing them enough. I forgot I'm the dad. I get to decide. So then spirituality, I put down to visit three new churches by the end of the year. So just go to a service at three new churches. See if I can find one I like. Put down a goal for each one of these. For friends, I put to do a, a, a friend's trip within the next 12 months. I haven't done a, a, uh, any kind of getaway with my high school buddies in forever. So I put that down as a simple goal. And then for self, maybe you put down hire a trainer so I can be more fit. Hire a dietitian or whatever, a nutritionist. Uh, something that's going to help you satisfy one of the frustrations that you wrote down. The frustrations part was the brainstorming on what to set a goal about, and then you set a goal to fix the frustration. The same thing's about to happen in your business. Am I allowed to go a little longer, Jonas, or do I got to cut it off? You are completely good. All right. So uh, is she back yet, Fee? Good. Can you give her the, uh, is she, is she on? Is she over there? This yeah, I'm right here. Okay, what do you mean? Don't, don't ever leave again. She's horrible. <laughs> All right. So put the one year business plan up there. Okay. So you're going to fill out these answers with me as we go. All this work we've been doing have been coming up to fill this out. So on a blank piece of paper, you're going to write the answers down and then you can get this form and actually fill it out on the form. So. Write down what your current, what you made this year. What you're going to make this year. Write it down on a piece of paper. If you're not writing things down, I'm getting frustrated. Write down how much you made. Write down how much, how many units you're going to do. The year's almost over. You should know all these numbers. How many units you're going to do. Write down how many team members you have. If you share a team member, you have a half of one. If you have your own assistant, uh, or uh, escrow office, uh, escrow coordinator or whatever you have for your team, write it down. If you have zero, it's zero. Write down how much you spend a month in expenses. You're going to have to guesstimate this stuff for now. And then you'll get this form and you can get more exact. Write down next is number five, your current sources of business. Okay? Current sources of business. I gave you the three that work the best. But we'll get to that as a goal setting part in a minute. Write down where you get your business, your database, your advertising, write down where it comes from. And then write down what the percentage is, how much of your business comes from each section. Now this part's super important. Write down your biggest weakness in business right now. You guys aren't writing stuff down. How are you going to set goals and do a business plan without a pen? 
Okay, not you, Chelsea. You're very good. Cool. Biggest current weakness. Like my biggest weakness in business is I'm spread too thin. I don't, I overcommit. I just say yes to everything and I got to learn not to. That's my biggest weakness. What's your income per deal? So that's easy to figure out. How many units did you do this year? How much money did you make? And you can figure out how much you make per deal. And I know you don't know it exactly, just guess it. What is that? Someone's calling you. All right. We wrote down how much you how much did you uh, save as a percentage of your income? We worked on that already. How many hours a week are you working? That's number nine. I want to know how many hours a week you're working. Be real. Like if you go to work and then go to the mall and then come back to work, that wasn't, you don't get to count the time when you did other stuff during the day. How many hours a week are you working? Be real. I The biggest frustration I have with coaching uh, people in our business is they say they work 60 hours a week, but they really work about 25 or 30. So be real. How many hours a week are you working? Um, and then write down your average sales price. Let's scroll up a little bit so we can see the bottom half, Rebecca. If you're a loan officer, you write down loan amount. If you're a realtor, you write down sales price. So now we're going to write down some goal. We're going we're gonna to pretend like it's December 2023. How much money did you make? Like how much money will you make next year? Be realistic. If you made 100 grand this year, unless you got something something going on already don't write down you're going to make 500 grand next year the normal growth that we see that's predictable is 20 percent 20 percent growth in a year is realistic if it's more than that if you want to grow more than 20 percent in a year you're going to have to do three things number one is hire a mentor or a coach number two is work 70 hours a week right and number three is you're going to have to hire staff. Otherwise, you're not going to grow that much. Those are mandatory. So tax, ta taxable income will be. Then it says, how many units do you need to do for that? So you take, we figured it out up top that your average income per unit is, let's say it's 10 grand. Now you do the division. How much do you want to make versus how much you're currently making per deal? That'll tell you how many units you need to close next year. In real estate, it's usually three closings per full-time employee. I don't know how big your team is, but one realtor by themselves, they can do 50, nah, they can do 35 to 40 deals a year. And then with two, with a full-time assistant, they could do 60, maybe 70 deals a year if they're really hustling. But write down how much your business expenses will be. Are you going to take on advertising expenses? Write them down what you think is in your mind for your plan. Then write down your new sources of business. So your existing ones, plus if you're going to add one. Are you going to add a business to business channel? Write down your sources of business and what the percentages will be next year. I gave you what we see in the core. 50% of the closings come from database, a quarter from advertising, and a quarter from business to business. So right now, if 100% of your business comes from your database, then you can add advertising or add business to business to grow. Number six is what's your bit like? How are you going to improve? What skill? Write down what skill you need to improve on the most to grow next year. I gave you a bunch of examples in the beginning of the call about skills you need for being a realtor or a lender, and you know which ones that you've been slacking at. How many deals an agent can average makes? Uh, it's three sides a month, so that's thirty six a year that a realtor can do if they work about 50 hours a week, if they're good and they really do work 50 hours a week, uh, they can do, that's about how many they can do. 
So it's three closings per full-time person on the team. So if you if it's you plus one more staff member, whether they be an assistant or a transaction coordinator, if they're full-time on your team, then you could get to five or six sides a month, which is 60 or 70 deals a year. Hopefully that answered your question. Um, getting back to line number six on the projected business, I want you to write down in that box or on that line, what is the skill you need to get better at? What's the one sticking out in your brain that you need to get better at the most? Is it your listing presentation? Is it how you work with buyers? Is it how you make offers on houses? Is it how you get leads? What is the skill you need to get best at to really improve your business? I get distracted when people put their face like this. All right. So then your income per transaction will be. So is it going to stay the same or you're going to try to increase it by increasing your average sales price? Listen, I don't recommend it. What's the markets that are going to be strongest next year? First time home buyer and must move ups, period. How much you're going to save a month next year? Write that down. How many hours you're going to work a week? And then if you're gonna if you're gonna grow your average sales price or loan amount, write down what your goal for that is. So I'm 16 minutes over. We've got this all this stuff in a package that's been emailed already, or if it's not, Rebecca's gonna do it any minute to all the loan officers who participated on this call. So if you're a realtor, you can get all of this stuff from them. So this is the first step in doing a business plan, right? So it may seem like, well, what, how are we going to do it? That's what we work on from now until December 15th. So you get together with your loan officer. Whoops, can you talk about the five markets? Yes, I could do that. Uh, I'll do that. So you fill out this, this beginning draft of a business plan. And then for the next month, you work on your business plan and get it more detailed. And you work on it with your summit funding loan officer because they have access to all this stuff. You set a meeting, you go to a breakfast spot, you go sit in the back, you order breakfast and coffee, you got papers spread out over the place and you do your business plan. You do your marketing calendar, you set your time block for your week. They know what to do. You just got to reach out to them. They got me in their ear all the time. So they'll be able to help. you. So the five, ha, sorry, it's true, Terry. I'm in your ear all the time. Um, so someone asked me to talk about the five markets. So here's the five markets the way I see them. The high-end top market, this happens when the economy is booming and everybody's making lots of money. That is land and investment property, okay? Lots and land, excuse me. Number two is uh, the second market, or number, it's, it's the fourth market. It happens when the, the economy is doing really well. Is, is investment property and second homes. People don't buy second homes if they're not really confident with their income and don't have a lot of money. People don't buy lots and land unless they got a lot of money and are confident in their income. So those are at the high end. So below, below that is luxury homes. Okay, luxury homes are a million, in Sacramento, I used to say a million dollars or more. It might be a million and a half or more now, I don't know. But a million dollars or more, that's a luxury home, right? Five-car garage, pool that looks like you're at the Taj Mahal, like two kitchens, outdoor kitchen, that's a luxury home. So then below that is uh, move up. Move up buyers. And then the first market is first-time home buyer. So as an economy has inflation and consumer confidence goes down, and it's all over the news, what's happening, and people get scared. The only markets that still work are first time home buyer and must move up. Your wife comes home pregnant, and then three months later, you find out it's triplets and you live in a two bedroom house. Guess what? You're going to buy a house. You got to move up. That's a must move up. It doesn't matter what rates are, it doesn't matter what's happening. You got to move up. If you don't own a house and you're paying rent or you're living with your parents and they're driving you nuts, you'll buy a house as long as you can afford it. That's a first-time home buyer. So your marketing and your business strategy next year 
has to include that. It has to. If you're doing open houses for two and a half million dollar houses, you may want to consider changing your market strategy a little bit. That's what I think. But I think anything can work if you work hard enough at it. Other last questions for me, Jonas, before I wrap up? Nope, I think we got them covered, Jim. Cool. Listen, we appreciate you guys. We appreciate your business. We do this once a month to give you, to give back, to help you with your business, to help you be a better realtor, all in the hopes that you will choose us to be your business partner and we'll help you get your deals closed. All right, guys, I'll see you later. Thanks, David. Bye. Guys, thank you very much. This has been